it is going to be uncomfortable for everybody. But until we're willing to be uncomfortable, healing can't happen. Because if we're not uncomfortable, we haven't changed nothing. What's up, y'all? Welcome to another video of Tea Time with Letitia. In this video, I am drinking orange spice, orange and spice tea. And the benefits of this tea is that it uh, is detoxifying and it provides some antioxidants. Now, I will admit to y'all, I'm a little nervous about drinking this tea because I've had it for like a year, don't judge me, maybe even two years. Um, but I got rid of the box and for some reason, like I had one packet left. And I think that I gave away the box because the tea upset my stomach. I don't remember though. So we just gonna try it and <laughs> see what happens. Uh, and then also, I want to know that this is uh, impromptu tea time with Leticia, uh, specifically because of the things that have been going on during this time in the Black community. And I feel like we need to um, get some professional information and tips to get through this period in time. With that being said, I'm going to let today's guest introduce herself. All right, so hi, I am Courtney Tucker. Um, Leticia gave me some things that she wants me to cover. I would rather just say I'm Courtney Tucker. Um, so, but I'll let you all know, um, my background is kind of eclectic, I like to say. Um, so I have a bachelor's in chemistry from my favorite university ever, Clark Atlanta University, where we find a way or make one. I have a master's in chemistry from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I have a PhD in educational studies from Emory University, and I have a master's in social work from Smith College. Um, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, right now. That's the profession I'm pursuing. I've done a bunch of other stuff before that, but right now what I'm doing is being a actively being a licensed clinical social worker. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, Leticia kind of woke me up and said, hey, let's talk. So I'm here. Uh, would be really interesting to see what she's about to ask me, given everything that's been happening overnight, um, that's happening now. Uh, born and raised um, in Decatur, Georgia, right outside Atlanta, east side of Atlanta. Uh, went to Southwest DeKalb High School, the home of champions. And so just really um, excited to see where we're going to go from here. Leticia, it's on you. So before I ask my questions, what tea are you drinking today? I am drinking some ginger lemon tea that I made. Uh, crushed some ginger and lemon and put it on the stove and boiled it in some alkaline water. Uh, really good for digestion and inflammation. Nice. All of these ginger teas coming out. I'm going to have to try it. I still have not tried Indira's ginger garlic tea, but maybe um, when I get rid of all my tea packets, I'm just going to go straight natural and get whole ingredients. That's the goal. It's nothing yeah. like it. Love it. So the question or the conversation is going to revolve around these two questions. And I really just want to get Courtney's advice and her thoughts and, you know, how she feels about the situation being the pandemic and the uh, murders within the Black community and just how we can handle it. So the first question being, as a person going through being in this situation, how can I cope and make sure that I'm appropriately healing um, just making sure that I'm staying on top of my mental health through this process. And then the second question is, how can someone else help me? So kind of like what guidance or what um, things can they do to help me going through it? So Leticia, I think the first thing that has to happen before you can heal from anything, you have to be able to acknowledge where the hurt is. You have to be able to acknowledge where the pain is. So where am I experiencing this? Am I experiencing it in my body? Is it in my back? Is it in my head? Is it in my shoulders? Where am I physically experiencing the trauma of this situation? 
So, From there, you decide, how do I then begin to heal those places of me, right? And so if I'm feeling it and I'm tense and it's all in my shoulder, do I need to do some stretching, right? Do I need to have a moment where it can be just five minutes with you just stretched out on the floor, just being still, right? If it's in my stomach, does that mean I need to do some lemon and ginger tea, some stuff to heal, some warmth? Do I need to get some warmth flowing throughout my body? Is it in my head? Do I need to do some aromatherapy? Do I need to turn the lights off, the phone off, and everything for a minute and just take a moment and be by myself? Is the trauma so intense that I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't describe what I'm feeling? I just know I'm feeling it. So do I need to take a moment and just let tears come and acknowledge that I'm feeling helpless and hopeless right now? And that's okay but I have to give myself permission to even begin to investigate where all of this is affecting me, right? And not push through. Like this isn't a push through moment, right? Like I'm just gonna act like it's not happening. Like you said, some of us are in different places where we can do that. We, it's a bubble, we can be in our bubble and I can address it when I want, I can jump in and I can jump out. But even understanding that jumping in and jumping out, jumping in, jumping out, jumping in, jumping out, that's creating trauma too, because you're doing this repetitive injury to yourself mm -hmm. as you're jumping in and you're jumping out. So you haven't learned to control it. You haven't learned to heal from it. You just keep touching. You're like, okay, I'm gonna get hot for a little while and I'm gonna come back and get cold. I'm gonna get hot for a little while and I'm gonna come back and get cold, right? And so, but the thing is, you haven't learned to withstand being hot. So the question more becomes that, am I in a place in my life that I can stay in the hotness and acknowledge the feelings and I can see where it's happening? Some people have experienced so much trauma and the compound effect of it that the, uh, they can't deal with the trauma because I, I, I haven't healed from what I've got behind me. Mm. Right, so as much as we're talking about, you know, how do you heal, we have to acknowledge that some of us have experienced the racial trauma and the impact of it more than others. And because of that, it's really hard to say, I can't just, I gotta, I, I need to just, I literally have been in a fire and I need an ice bath. That, that's healing for them. But the question becomes, I still got to go back into the, I still got to go to work. I still got to deal with my colleagues. I still got to eventually turn the news on and see what happens. So the other question is, if I have to do that, how can I go back and be able to put a barrier around myself? So, so much doesn't seep in that I have to go so quickly from hot to cold. Mm -hmm. How can I slow it down? So that um, makes me think about the fact that, I mean, most people are getting the information from social media outlets like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And that's something that we can control when we get on. Uh, and I even I found myself during this time is like, I would say, okay, you know what? I just need to put my phone away. Like I'm not going to scroll through my Facebook feed anymore because everything on it is about what's going on right now. It's about these murders. It's about uh, the pandemic. It's about money issues. So I'm just going to not deal with it, not look at it. So is that kind of like a, also that jump in, jump out kind of thing? Like, are we just triggering more trauma for us? I mean, I think it's almost as if you want to say we're in an experience about what we're having. If I just think about everything that's happened over the last week, right? Like just everything that's come out from the woman in the park calling somebody because she's black or the young lady, they stormed her house, right? And she got killed. If we think about like just any, just in the last week, right? And I think what's happened is people are able to be more stable when the trauma is titrated. Right, like we haven't experienced when it's titrated. Like, you know, we have something that we might be upset about like once a month, once every three months, but there's no longer a titration of it. Mm -hmm. And so now it's almost like the floodgates have been opened. <laughs> you know, cause not only are you looking at this and you're seeing that people are protesting efforts, but you're also thinking they gotta go home. It's COVID-19. 
What are, what are we all about? What are we about to bring home in the midst of this, right? So there's this tension between, but they had to pick which, what was going to be, it's almost like you have to pick your poison. So you almost have to pick your trauma in the moment and how you're going to deal with it. Right? So for some of us, that poison is, I, 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 and, and you, we have to acknowledge it comes from our places of privilege that we can say, you know what, my trauma is, I'm keeping me and mama, we're going to be safe, we stand in the house. But for other people, they, their poison, their, their poison or trauma is different, mm -hmm. and they're choosing to go out and to be about. And so you're asking, how do we all heal from it? I think the healing comes first. Like I said, you have to acknowledge what effect is this having on you, right? And you say, how can other people be there for others? It can be a phone conversation where somebody can really say, I'm having attention because there's part of me that wants to be out there. I can't ignite. Like, there's part of me that is feeling the same rage and part of me that would love to be burning stuff, throwing stuff. Like there's part of me that really wants to do that. But also there's part of me that recognizes I can't do that because then who's going to get them? Who's who going to do bail money? Who's going to do therapy? Who's going who's gonna to be there, right? So it's this burden of being in a different class right? This burden of privilege. And so just having a space or a person that you can actually talk about those tensions with, right? And sometimes that means you just need somebody to listen and to hear you cry and just make sense out of nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that makes me think about, it. I had a conversation with uh, one of my friends about just like, this whole situation and how some people, you know, say if you're not out there protesting, then you're, you know, you're a part of the enemy. You're a part of the problem. And um, I feel like everyone has their purpose and everyone has their place within this situation. And it varies. I think the thing that's really important and that you're expressing is that a movement takes all people, right? And if a movement takes everybody, there are going to be some that are going to be outside picketing, protesting. There'll be some that'll be, you know, everybody has a place, right? And then there are going to be some that are going to be in their houses. There are going to be some that are at tables. But it's going to take a joint move. Like, we're not just trying to address something that's been here three weeks <laughs> you know what I'm saying like racism race racism cultural oppression has been here longer than we've been here yeah right longer than 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 black folks have were they, that they got this they you know Native American they were doing it first so it's been here longer than us which means it's going to take a lot of different people, places for us to be placed in a lot of different ways in order for there to be impact. I think you asked part of how can I heal is you have to decide in this movement as I'm experiencing this and I'm feeling helpless and I'm feeling powerless, what are the areas in my life that I'm willing to become uncomfortable to forward the effort? Mm -hmm. And I have to be okay with what I come to as my areas of uncomfortability and I can't judge others because everybody's level of wanting getting to a place and what they're willing to do to be uncomfortable is going to look different and this is where that part about knowing your voice and your purpose is important. Mm, though that is literally the exact same thing Arpen and I were saying is that you have to know your purpose And, but see, part of the thing that's hard, especially about going on social media and about walking in your purpose, is that we're so used to having that purpose validated externally that in these moments, we have to be okay with that purpose only being validated by us feeling good about what we were able to do, regardless of whether anybody else recognizes it. Mm. And that... Uh, the fact that you know we are staying at home I think that that is like another layer of it something that I was scrolling through my Facebook timeline and I saw which I haven't even seen in a while was um it was like uh pictures of Denzel diffusing a situation Denzel Washington the actor diffusing 
a situation between a black homeless man and some white police officers. And I was like, wow, like I have not seen like anyone really posting up just a act of, you know, an act of kindness like that. Like it's been so aggressive. And a part of me thinks that it's because half the people are, if you're not out there protesting and physically being aggressive, you're sitting at home and being, I guess, like, but some people would even say, I mean, it depends on your frame, because some people would even say that what Denzel did was aggressive. You know, like there are people that would say he shouldn't have protested, he shouldn't have approached the cops, or he shouldn't have launched in, right? And so it's a perception piece, right? So also we have to understand that it's from our place and our lens and our perception of what is intervention and what's, what seems peaceful and calming. And we're like, okay, that's good. That doesn't feel disruptive. But over here, this feels more disruptive. And just acknowledge that sometimes we get to those places because we can see ourselves as doing that, that Denzel did, but we can't see ourselves doing what's happening over here, particularly like in my home state of Atlanta last night. Like we can't see ourselves standing on top of the CNN thing, but I can see myself doing the Denzel thing. I think we have to get to a place to recognize like you can't judge either of them. Each of them is a personal choice and each of them is, are coming from personal histories. And each of them are coming from different places of privilege and class and educational attainment. And, the, and they're coming from different places of frustration and coming from different places of knowing myself and how I value myself, right? And how I value the future that I can see for myself. Mm, that was real. That was real, real what you just did. I really do appreciate that because like, I didn't even realize that in me saying that that was me being judgmental. So, wow. But yeah, no, there, I don't even know how to verbalize like what all just happened then in the sense of like me expressing what I thought was an act of kindness versus what I feel is being an act of aggressiveness and how my perception plays or my bias or my experiences played a big part in my thought process. I mean, so it's almost as if it's the same thing that you would see or that would happen in, let's say, a black mom discipline their child versus another mother, a white mother discipline their child. They're, they negotiate with them. You know, traditionally, there's a negotiation. There's a, you know, they don't raise their voice where a black woman would be like, you better go sit down. And you know, I, I don't want to hear what you have to say. That is, and that has been labeled as aggressive and abusive behavior. Some people will say, mm, but for me, that's discipline. You know, like, ooh, I can't, and, 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 or you will see the mom that snatches the kid up off the floor because they, they, they're crying because they can't get a toy in the store. And she's like, oh, we're not doing this today. Snatch them up. The other one tries to say, come on now, we're going to help you. We just want you to get up, calm down, it's gonna be okay. The one that snatched our kid up will get child and protective services called on her because she's being an aggressive mom. That's tough. <laughs> um, like even now, like I think about stuff like that all the time and how it, response to situations and how aggressive or not aggressive it's all about like the lens of the person who's looking at it but I don't, everything is opinion but some stuff I just feel like is there should be like a very clear understanding of if the child I don't know some stuff I just feel like it's is there an extra them going to too big of an extreme like some stuff is okay. <laughs> that may be like a toxic part of you coming out and saying that. I gave you that example because I wanted to let you know there are places in your life that you will judge some aggressiveness okay 
and there are places in your life that you're judging and not okay. And so we have to understand that as we're watching all of this happen, and acknowledge I'm using my barometer. Mm. And some of the things that might be done by others in different situations, they could look at you and be like, what, what, is, what, what is this? You being aggressive. That, that just sounds so hard to tackle <laughs> or even so hard to think about. Can we, can we get past, not get past this, but can we like work through this? I think it's, you asked me what needs to happen in this moment. There needs to be more curiosity and less judgment. So we need to get to a place that instead of judging it and feeling pained by it, that I'm curious about why this is an expression of feelings, right? Underneath anger and rage is always, we always say, like, you know, there's an anger iceberg. There are, there's stuff underneath the surface. Like what we're seeing right now is just the tip of an iceberg. There's so many other feelings that are beneath that. And can we get to a place that we can see what's above the surface, but remain curious about what's beneath it? Because in order to heal it, we have to deal with what's beneath it and not what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So healing and starting with healing is in physically figuring out where in your body you're feeling the tension or the upsetness and then being curious about, you know, where it's coming from. Yes. And then looking at and dealing with that. So my question for you would be, you talked about like, I can't look at my Facebook feed. I can't do this. So now my question for you would be, what about looking at your feed triggers you? What, what feelings, what, what is, what's coming up for you? It's just too much. You know, they always post in like. See, now you're, you're not telling me the feelings. See, you're saying it's too much, but I'm asking you to go a little bit deeper. And I want you to tell me what feelings, if I ask you to pull out your phone and instead of telling me what you see, tell me what you feel. Hurt. That, that is the big one, hurt. Just to see that people have to result to this level of action to express themselves. So, and I think that's on both sides as well, too, not just on our side. It's like, why do they feel that they need to, why do white people feel like they need to attack us like this? And then why are we having to respond like this? So what, so now I'm going to ask you, the hurt that you see, the hurt you're talking about of people not feeling seen, not feeling heard, and they're feeling like in order for me to get a response to what I've experienced, this is the behavior I feel like I have to exhibit. And then the hurt from the other side about how do I control these actions or how am I minimizing it? So you're feeling hurt from both sides. When have you felt that in your life before? Oh, Lord. We got to go deeper. <laughs> I don't know. Feeling hurt from both sides in that same way. That is a question that I would definitely need to ponder more on. But I think that is a good place to end this conversation. And I want to thank you so much for all of your insight and your time and just your information, even just having this conversation with me, I feel like I just got a therapy session and I <laughs> wasn't expecting that. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And I want to leave you with this. Um, one of the things, and it's a quote by John F. Kennedy. So it's by somebody, John F. Kennedy said, 
Those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. And so if we think about what we're seeing, you know, when the peaceful protests of kneeling and t-shirts and I can't breathe and all that was happening, that wasn't allowed. It was silence, it was shut down, it was made economically a hardship for a lot of people that took part in it. And so this is the manifestation of the peaceful protest didn't get me anywhere. Yeah, voices will be heard one way or another. And much like a little kid, and if we just think about children, when they don't feel heard or seen, they come back by and they waving at you, mama, you, you see me, you see me. They're trying to be seen. They want to be seen. They're going to provoke your attention. If you really stop paying attention, they will scream and yell. They'll come kick you. They will hit you. They're like, you are going to give me some attention. You're going to acknowledge my presence. And until you do, they will aggravate you. And they'll just, it'll just, it, they'll be a thorn in your flesh until you begin to acknowledge what they need. Mm. Mm. This conversation. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow. Okay, so I'm probably gonna cut the recording like at the end of what you just said. But I had to, because I was like, wait a minute, you hit a trigger. <laughs> you just like, where in your life? My brain zeroed in. And I was like, oh, whoa, we just hit like a real point in this conversation. Like, you came for me. <laughs> How you going to say I came for you? <laughs> oh, you came for me. Yeah, because you were like, uh, yeah, we're not going to answer that question because you're about to make me. <laughs> <laughs> no, because the reason I pushed you, and I'm going to be, like, let's just be, tra the reason that moment happened is because the heart, the main reason we're seeing what we're seeing is because the hurt that people are having now resembles a hurt from before. It resembles a frustration. So it's levels of it. And so mm -hmm. if we can't acknowledge the initial hurt, if I can't say this is where it starts, Right. If I can't say for me walking in a room as a kid at an all black high school and people automatically assuming I'm at risk. Well, at risk for what? Where, where y'all get this from? Mm. But if we can't acknowledge when that initial hurt happened, when was it when, you know, you see your, your family member stretched out in the street just because they're coming home from work late at night and actually a manager and then slacks in a bun down but police think they're a drug dealer and they got their badge on. Right? So a lot of what we're seeing, the hurt is hurts that we felt before. And this is just, re it's like a wound that's being reopened. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It, it is. And so the thing is to get that, and you want to know how do we heal if I can't acknowledge what started the wound? And what continues to feel like somebody's sticking their finger in it? Then how am I going to truly heal? Oh, man. So, see, okay, maybe I should have uh, <laughs> took advantage of Capson, uh, came to see you set up some sessions, but you leave it now. But, um, so, okay, you figure out what is the initial hurt, where it started, then what? Then you work on healing that child or wherever you were in your life, you heal that person first. So that initial hurt was from the day that you were laid on the ground. If that's where that hurt was, then I need to heal that person that pushed through and then acknowledge the pain in that moment. Okay. 
Oh my goodness. Because when I can do that, then when something else happens, I can deal with the hurt from that, that particular situation versus the compound hurt of all of it. Mm -hmm. So do you ever get to a place where you are like, I mean, I guess like, do you ever get to a place of being fully healed or like at least being to a place where you can acknowledge things as they come? You can, but you have to do that. You have to acknowledge them as they come. But that work comes from, the other thing is you have to understand some stuff that we're not healed from, we don't know we're not healed from until something hits it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. So until, you're, until a mirror has been shown to you of yourself and you're willing to work on that, See, we can think we're healed. Oh, yes, Lord. Like, I'm good. I'm safe. Da, 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 something happens and you're like, why am I in the corner and can't stop crying? Oh, because there's something I haven't healed from that I need to acknowledge. You and this, must, this touched on that. Like, you know, like, I think we as Black people are really good at burying stuff alive. <laughs> and we bury it alive because sometimes it's the only way you can survive. But as we grow, it's those things that we've buried alive that stick up and they pull. And they will become emotional weights that will keep you from growing into who you want to be because they are pulling your legs and they will not let you fly. Mm. You know, yep. I thought, yep. I, you know, I would have never made that connection though. Would have never made it. I would have just thought it's okay for me not to want to look at the phone and just put the phone down. I think we will never heal racially from racial injustices or cultural oppression if we don't figure out how we can lean into our discomfort. It is going to be uncomfortable for everybody. But until we're willing to be uncomfortable, healing can't happen. Because if we're not uncomfortable, we haven't changed nothing. We haven't disrupted mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't get muscles physically if you're comfortable. Your endurance doesn't change when you're trying to run a race if you only do the miles you feel comfortable doing. Mm. You just dropped all types of words and bars. I'm probably going to take out chunks of this section, too. <laughs> oh, man. I'm glad, though. I'm glad, though. Uh, I think I had a false... I'm not going to say it was completely false. But, like, I, I knew that there were certain areas of me that I had healed. But... Yeah, like I said, the phone, like, connecting that to something previous and, like, why, like, and that is a very big wound for me that, <laughs> like, I just, I wouldn't have made that connection to realize that I still do need to heal from that. But, like, I just would have never thought about it. Like, it was something that I buried. Well, this is why... I want to say this is why therapy can be important for communities of color and why a black therapist can be good for a community of color. <laughs> like, because these are the conversations that can happen if we allow it. So it's not just about me coming because I'm in crisis, right? Like therapy isn't just about showing up because you're in crisis. It's about how can I utilize this to help me be the best version of myself that I can be in the moment? Mm -hmm. And how can I acknowledge 
that I don't have stuff happen to me that I don't want to think about that I need to heal from because the tentacles of it are affecting my future. Mm. You know what? And honestly, I will admit one of the reasons why, like I've always wanted to go to therapy, like even as a kid, I knew in like eighth grade, I think I want to say like middle school, I'm like, it's just the words. So maybe not look at it as therapy, but for me, a therapist is a facilitator of a healing journey. So you ask me, you start off with the question is, how do I heal? Well, if you can't figure out how to jumpstart that healing process for yourself, then you go find you a facilitator for healing. Mm -hmm. Call it something different. Change the perception. Yeah. 